got to have a little Mother's Day message. Amen? Amen. So we're going to step away from our normal teaching uh, and the keys to Bible study, and we'll be back to those next week. So Mother's Day is, is actually a day that, de deservingly so, every year we set aside uh, to recognize our mother. We recognize the women in our lives that we should love and cherish. And in the family structure, each person plays a role uh, in the establishment of the family unit. But for most people, the role of the mother is a very special one. It's the reason why when you see a sports star uh, on TV, uh, the very first person that he'll recognize is he'll say, hey, mom. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get many hey, dads. But it's just the way it is, and dads understand it, and we keep going. That's not to, to, to minimize or denigrate the role of the father. Because the father is important. And the father has been given by the Lord a very special role and responsibility in training up and leading the home. But it is the mother that has been given the role to guide the children and to guide the home and to be a keeper of the home. She's called to be the help me to her husband. And any wise man, any wise child would be the first to tell you that Without his mother, he would be a fractured person. On a personal note, my mother and my wife, who is sick today, so she's not here, uh, so pray for her. My wife, who is the mother of my children, in my life, they are clearly two of the most important women in my life. I can attest to the fact that Without the two of them, I would not be the person that I am today. My life would most likely be in shambles, and to be honest, I don't know where I would be without the women in my life. But in the structure of the church, and in the framework of the family, God has called for and expects for first and foremost, there to be male leadership. Amen. Okay, we don't, we don't want to go past that. We, we live in a day of the feminist movement, and we live in a day of progressivism. Uh, and, and I'm the one who believes that uh, just because we live in that day does not remove what the scripture says Amen. concerning Amen. male leadership. Amen. And God expects for there to be male leadership. Uh, both in the church yes. and in the home. Yes. But the Bible has a lot to say about the role of a woman throughout history, and in particular, the scriptures have much to say about mothers. Some of the greatest men in history attribute their greatness to their mothers and to the role that she played in their lives and to their wives as well. Most men, great men, men of renown, if they're honest, must attribute most of their greatness and their success, watch this, to a woman. In particular, their mothers. Let me show you something that the scripture says to us. It says this in Exodus chapter 20, in verse 12. It says, honor thy father, and thy mother. And then he says this, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Yeah. So what God does is that he attributes length of days on the earth to honoring the mothers and fathers that he has given us. When we think of honor, it means to reverence them. Yes. It means to make sure that our conduct demonstrates the level of respect yes. that our parents are due and the name that they have given us. 
But see, I've said this a few Sundays ago. My mother and my father gave me the steward name, and I was always told to make sure that I carried that name with honor so that I did not disrespect the steward name. I have passed that on to my children as well. What we're to do is we're to hold our parents in high esteem and honoring them demonstrates the esteem that we hold for them. So today I want to take the time to examine four women. And these four women are women in biblical history. And I want to examine the roles that they played in the lives of three of the greatest men in biblical history. An example I'm going to give is of four important mothers in Scripture. So today we're going to begin with the mother of Solomon. Now when we look at wisdom, we're told in scripture that the wisest man to ever live was a man by the name of Solomon. It was fair to reason that in the same manner that although he received his wisdom from God, yeah. that he also gained wisdom from his mother. Amen. That same wisdom is told of Solomon's mother as she was preparing her son in life. And it says this in Proverbs chapter 31. It says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son? And what, the son of my womb? And what, the son of of my vows. And this was her wisdom. She says, give not thy strength unto women, Amen. nor thy ways to that which destroy a king. But who is the mule, or he's called mule in some other parts? Most interpreters are of the opinion that the mule is Solomon. That was his pen name. And the mother mentioned in his biological is, is his biological mother, none other than Bathsheba. Now the name the name the mule signifies one that is for God or devoted to God. And so it agrees well enough with that honorable name which by divine appointment was given to Solomon. Now ironically, Solomon was known for being a man that had many women. We would call him, well, I won't go there. <laughs> Unfortunately, he had many women and those women destroyed his life when it was all said and done. But that destruction was not because his mother did not forewarn him about women. See, sometimes we can warn our children, but it doesn't mean that they're going to take heed to what we say. And it wasn't because Solomon's mother didn't warn him about women, but Solomon clearly had a woman problem. Yes. <laughs> she apparently had observed that when he was still a young man, that he had an inclination towards women. Therefore, she found it necessary to take him to task concerning this. Now, when a man gives up his character, his integrity, his self-respect, and values only to get a woman. He enters into a danger zone. But this much I know. Y'all trying to make me laugh, but I'm not going there. Right now. I know 
this having a mother and a wife and sisters, that women know women. And most men would be wise to listen to their mothers, sisters, when it comes to women, especially the women that they might intend on dating. Yeah. She'll be the first to tell you, uh, we know about her. Solomon's mother was no different. Had more men listened to the advice of their mothers throughout history, hear me now, the divorce rate in our country wouldn't be above 53%. That's right. That's right. Unfortunately, Solomon was no, no different than most men today. While his mother was warning him not to give his strength unto women, unfortunately, he never took her advice. It says this of Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 11. It says, but King Solomon loved many strange women. <laughs> Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, he loved the Moabite women, the Ammonite women, the Edomite women, the Zidonians, and the Hittite women. He didn't care. He just loved women. It says, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, here was the major problem that God didn't want them to go in to other women. He says, they will turn away your heart after their God. Saw the claim unto thee, the love. See, it was the issue. The issue was, he wanted to know that if you have a woman that's not an Israeli woman, I've given them the standard by which they're to live as women. But when you go outside of what I told you to do, then you enter into a zone and you enter into a woman who doesn't love God, and what she will do is she will keep you home on Sunday. Yeah. Yes, she will. She won't be the one driving you to say, come on, sweetie, let's go to Bible study now. She'll be the woman who, on Saturday morning, she's coming home from Friday night. It goes on to say this in verse 3. Solomon was a bad boy. It said that he had 700 wives. I don't know how he did it. I'm trying to keep the what I got. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives, plural, turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. As was the heart of David his father. Who was another woman I yes. yes. See, the fruit falls not far from the tree. Amen. Amen. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And it destroyed his testimony. His mother's warning was because she knew that if those women were not godly women, women who loved the same God that he loved, women who were worshipers of God, women who were servants of the Lord, that it was only a matter of time before he too would turn his heart after other gods. This is the danger that is the wisdom and this is the warning that she gave him. It is why the scripture warns us this. We're told not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And the reason that you don't want to be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever is because again, they have a different God. They're not, their God is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Their God is not the God that would drive a good man 
to be a godly man. Listen. That warning law had a connection. And that connection had to do something also with alcohol. Because it continues in Proverbs 31. We read verses 1 through 3. Now it starts here in verse 4 and it says this. It is not for kings, O mule. She first warns of, of, of alcohol, I mean of women. Then she says, it is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and their alcohol causes them to forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. And why unto those that be of heavy hearts? Bathsheba warned her son to beware of wine and the dangers of alcohol. It is not a good thing to see any ordinary person to get drunk and make a fool of themselves. But I can tell you this, and I try not to be sexist when I say this. It's really bad when you see an alcoholic. A drunk. But it's something about seeing a drunk woman. A drunker the woman. That, that just, it's just, a, I don't know why. And, and again, don't, if I'm being sexist, be honest. Right? But it's something about seeing a drunker the woman. That this takes on, it just, it's just such a bad thing. And again, maybe we have, the, we, we, you know, men have been taught that and maybe we look at it differently. Because it's all the same. Amen. But it's just something about, the, uh, uh, we, you know, we do a lot of work in our church does in the homeless community. So when we're down in the homeless community, you see a lot of homeless men on street people, because there's a difference between someone who is homeless and goes in a shelter and it's a temporary situation and they work their way out. As if there are people who are homeless don't ever want to be yeah. in a home. That's right. They intend on living homelessness. Yes, they they, they that, and, and it's something that when you go and you drive up and you see a group of people and then you see a homeless alcoholic woman it's just something. It is. Drunks lose their sense of what is right from wrong. Mm -hmm. And Solomon's mother warned him against this behavior. A good mother will always warn her children of the unforeseen dangers in life. A good mother. That she would knew enough about the pursuits of drunkenness to make her want to warn her son against that sin. It's quite possible that she reflected upon her own husband, David, when he took Uriah the Hittite and made him drunk so that he could hide his sin by, getting, by using alcohol to get Uriah to go down and sleep with his wife and, she, and he refused to do it, but she knew that, that alcohol apparently played some role in what David was trying to do because it's, he tried to cover up sin right. using alcohol. And she said, son, I want to remind you not to be a drunkard. David first got Uriah drunk in hopes that he would go to his wife. And I'm sure that she reflected on that as she warned her son the dangers of being an alcoholic or drinking alcohol. Let me move on to another mother. My second prayer person, people today, would be the mother and grandmother of Timothy.
A mother has great power to influence her children. It's to be used for good. Unfortunately, all too often, mothers can influence their children for bad. But when we speak of a good mother and grandmother, I want you to consider the influences that the Apostle Paul spoke of Timothy's mother and grandmother. This is what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I served from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Oh man, what a great thing to say about a person. Amen? He's saying this about the, the kid that he won to the Lord. He discipled him. I'm saying this to my people who are discipling. This is the kind of relationship that he had with his disciple. But he says this, verse 4. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith, first of all, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that in thee also. Clearly, what had happened in Timothy's life was this. <laughs> the Apostle Paul had saw his son in the faith, a man whom Timothy loved and had a special bond and relationship with, but he knew that that relationship and that bond had been centered in the work that his grandmother and his mother had invested in his life. To bring him to be the person that he was. Amen. Here we have two generations of women of God. It, it, it's not difficult to see when there are generational. Hear me. Hear me. It's not difficult to see when there's generational godliness. Just as well as this, it's, it's not difficult to see when there's generation of foolishness. Yeah. 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 That we pass on to our children. Amen. Right? Amen. There are generations of, 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 of welfare recipients. Yes. Right? Yes. Where the grandmother was on welfare, the great great grandmother was on, I mean, you just go all back, and they all was on welfare. You, you, listen, in the jail system, which since we're involved in the jail system, you have mothers and fathers and grandfathers who are incarcerated. It's just passed on. Here we have generational godliness. Because, see, we pass on to these children, to our children, our great grandchildren, our children. We pass on a heritage of either foolishness or godliness. <laughs> These two generations of women, they loved the Lord, they loved Timothy, and they demonstrated what he calls unfeigned faith. So that even Paul could see their faith the faith of his mother, Eunice, and his great-grandmother, I mean, uh, they don't name her, Lois, right? He could see in, their, in, in his, his family tree through a boy. Demonstrate. We need to have generations of women who are known for their faith, and clearly the faith that Paul saw in Timothy was a faith that apparently Lois had passed down to Eunice, and Eunice had passed down to Timothy. And Timothy demonstrated it before the Lord. Amen. I mean, or before Paul. Solomon gave us an 
definition. And he said this is what we're to do in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6. He says, train up a child in the way that he should go. Amen. And when he is old, don't miss that part. Because see, there's always those middle years. Amen? Amen. But if you train him up in the way that he should go when he's old, yes. the promise of God is that he won't depart from it. Amen. Now that doesn't mean he won't get prodigal in the middle. Amen? Amen. And we all know our prodigal day. Amen? I had a I drove Alberta crazy. Yeah. She thought I, my head sputtering. Okay. <laughs> but the promise is that you train them up in the way that they should go. Now, we have a saying when we say we raise children. We don't raise children. What we do is we train children. See, we raise, we raise bananas. Okay. Chances. <laughs> right, we raise corn. Uh -huh. But we train children. That's right. what we do. All too often we live by the creed, do as I say, not as I do. But when we're training up a godly child, you train by demonstrating what to do and how it's to be done. Amen. You're training them whether you want to or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're either training them for good or you're training them for bad, but I guarantee you this. They're watching everything you do. Amen. Amen. Hey, my little boy, with Demetrius, he's 30. He's a father now. <laughs> but I remember I'd be cutting the grass at dawn and bought him one of the little bubble mowers. <laughs> he'd be right behind me with the bubbles flying. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Trying to cut this grass. Because you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to do what I did. Right. So he even walked like me. You think I trained, I taught him? I didn't teach him to walk like me, but I trained him to walk like me. Because you know what he was doing? He was observing me so that I was demonstrating to him what he was to be. And he watched everything. We train by demonstrating what it means to have what Timothy's grandmother and mother had. You know what you have to have? An unfeigned faith. Now the word unfeigned means not fake. Yeah. Hear me now. You can't come here and say hallelujah on Sunday and then go stop by the liquor store on the way home. Amen. Amen. <laughs> See, you can't, you can't train them up in an unfeigned faith, right? With, a, with an unfake faith, right? If you, you hurry up to say hello to me and then cuss your husband out when you get out in the car. Amen. <laughs> in front of your kids. See? You can't, you can't have a, 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 a serious faith in the Lord, men, if you break your neck to open the door for my wife and run your wife over to get the door open for mine. Amen. That's true. Because yep. she's a pastor's wife. Yep. You got it. They demonstrated a real serious faith. It wasn't fake. It wasn't something that they looked at. I guarantee you, they were consistent. They were on time. They did the right things. They lived out their faith in front of their children. Amen. They demonstrated it not on Sunday, but on Tuesday. Amen. Their faith was genuine. And it was a faith that apparently was something that was real. It's a faith that carries over after church. It's a faith that the neighbors see. It's a faith that is demonstrated every day of the week. It's a faith that can be seen. Watch this. Because this is where you determine if your faith is real. In the faith.
faith of, in the face of adversity. Oh, yes. All right. Oh, yes. See, see, because we say we trust the Lord. All right. And then, because we went out and spent a little more on the credit card. Mm -hmm. Then we look and say, oh, God, where are we? Mm -hmm. Well, hold on. Right. He's on your feet. Because mm -hmm. them shoes you bought. Oh. <laughs> The scriptures teach that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But the demonstration of our faith is something that is lived out in our lives. But fake faith is not real faith. Real faith is an enduring faith that shapes and molds, watch this, generation. Real faith produces real Christians whose faith is passed down from generation to generation. You know, and, and I'm a guy, I guess right now people are putting on Facebook there, you know, I'm, I'm uh, so and so and so and so old, and they yeah. uh, name a place in Kansas City, right? Because mm. I was born in General Hospital number two. Y'all know what that was? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's old. Most of y'all, there's old. <laughs> so it's not that old. So General Hospital Number Two, for those of you who may not know, uh, was the first all-black hospital uh, west of the Mississippi. Uh, it was a divided hospital. You know, the city has been the divided city, and they divided. You know. Certain people had to be born in this hospital, and then if you not, you had. And I was born in, in, in number two, right? But but I, I remember women and men in our neighborhood who I attribute the faith that I have today in the faith that they demonstrated in front of us because they were godly women and godly men. Now all of us knew the drum, right? And every neighborhood had one. Male and female. All of us knew, hear me now, I'm, I know I'm speaking serious. All of us know who the floozy lady was in the neighborhood. Come on, we all have them. No, 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 no. We all have them. Yeah. You know what? But God is still looking for an unfeigned faith in mm. our men and in our women. Yes. Yes. The seriousness about this thing, this godliness, Amen. Amen. that demonstrates in our neighborhood. You, you, you know, when when Miss Blue lived next door to me, and, and we when we would straighten up when we even walked past her house. <laughs> she didn't even have to be outside. She didn't even have to be home. And we knew that when we was walking past Miss Blue's house, that you know, it's just the way. And, and my mother was a young mother. Miss Blue and were older. Her and Miss Hunt, who lived across the street, and they they my, they trained mama. Right? They, when my father died, when I was five years old, they grabbed my mother and said, "Hey, you know, you got five children. Let's help you." And there was a godliness about them. Amen. It, I'm saying it to say this. That was the, the faith yes. that was in Lois and Eunice. Yes. Amen. It wasn't fake. No. It was real. It was built yeah. on love. They cared. They cared for they, they cared for this boy. Those women cared for us neighborhood kids. They could. They, if they thought we was hungry, they would help feed my mother feed us. See, they were demonstrating their faith. Amen. We don't even know who our neighbors are. Amen. Mm -hmm. When they see the level of importance of the things of God that are given in our lives, what we're doing is we're training them. But that faith must be real and not fake. It's not a faith that ever allows your children to see you. Watch this. In a compromising position after you shout the name of Jesus on Sunday. Romans 10 says this, so that faith cometh by hearing. Yes. And hearing? By the word of God. By the word of God. Amen. 
If faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then if mothers like Lois and Eunice are going to train up men to be Timothys of this world, they have to do that by allowing the word of God to be the handbook that they live by. The book that they love, the book that they demonstrate as being real and working in their lives. When that is done, our children learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. It's what Paul meant when he told this to Timothy. He said this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. He says, but continue thou in the things, watch this, which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing... Of whom thou hast learned them. He said, I'm going back to your mother and your grandmother. He says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Amen. Now he's saying something here. The responsibility is often put on our church to teach children the word of God. And there's an expectation that when they go back here that our Sunday school teachers will invest in them. Let me tell you something about Timothy. It was his grandmother and his mother who taught him the word of God. He learned it at home. He says they're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It's the scripture. Clearly, Timothy had women in his life who were women of God, women of integrity, women of faith, who taught him the way that he should go. That way is only found in the Holy Scriptures. So, in order for any person to know the Holy Scriptures from a child, they have to be taught the Holy Scriptures as a child. Amen. The best teaching comes by demonstrating. Never lose sight that there's an enemy that wants to destroy the family unit. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen. They want to destroy your little girls. They want to destroy your little boys. And God has placed them in your care. But he has also given you an instruction manual on how to train them children. How many people in your heard there ain't no book on how to raise children. Oh, yes, there is. God never wrote a book on how to be married. Oh, yes, he did. So what our church does is try to provide an opportunity for you to learn at least how to learn Amen. it. So you can teach it. Amen. You just need to be available to get it. The only thing that's going to be effectable to combat this world is the word of God. Amen. 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 Mothers, you have to live out your faith before your children. You have to live out Christ in your as the hope of glory in your life so that as your children are watching you, you are training them, watch this, by your behavior, which means that you need to be have a to have a behavior that becometh Christ. Amen. Let's look at our last mother today. She happened to be the mother of Jesus. And her name was Mary. Now we cannot look at mothers without looking at mother, the Mary of Jesus, the Mary, the mother of Jesus. Forgive me. Now the name of Mary is significant in its origin because the name Mary means wise woman or lady. Mary is one of the only women in scripture whose life story we can trace from when she was a young girl to a mature mother. Here, we have this young Jewish peasant girl from the village of Nazareth who at a very young age becomes pregnant and marries Joseph but bears a son called Jesus. She is depicted through the life of a young woman who does this, who trains up her child only to see him grow into the young man that goes on to teach and preach to his elders. Yeah. He taught those beyond his years, even as a young man. We still see her life when she's an aged woman 
whose son comes of age and is arrested, wrongly accused, and crucified on a cross, mm -hmm. all while she watches her son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Mary had to endure that. Mm -hmm. Christ is the central figure in the Gospels. <laughs> but the writers of the Gospel used Mary to shed light on the works of the Lord. So let's turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. And it says this in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 31. It says, There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. So Jesus' mother had come and the disciples were there and they said, hold on here, your, your mom's here, right? Your mother's here. And it goes on in verse 33 and says this. And he answered them saying, who is my mother? Oh, my brother. He was checking them. All right? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and brother. He didn't point to her. And then he gave us this. He says, For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Now Mary clearly is seen as the confident yet young leader of this family. But Jesus here sets a boundary for the family of God by saying, who is my mother or my brother? Letting us know that if we do the will of God, we are then family to him. That's my phone ring. Right? We are then family to him. Including the role of his mother. Now the thing to understand of Mary is this. She knew who to follow. She didn't just look at him and say, this young boy, this boy, this man, uh, you know, I'm not going to follow him. She knew who to follow and she knew who to call upon. She knew that he was the Lord and she knew to lead her children to him. What Jesus said she already knew. No longer was he her little boy, the infant Jesus, but the Jewish Messiah, of which she had waited for and the whole world was waiting for. She knew that he was to seek, she was to seek him, not he, her. See, he said, who is my mother? He was making a statement here. She should be looking for me because I am Messiah and she knew that she was to be looking for him. He didn't cat out and say, okay, I'll go on Messiah. Let me just bow down here for my mother. Now, Mary is deified in some, with some people. But Jesus never deified her. Amen. He never gave her that deity. We find another story in the Gospels. And it's in the Gospel of Luke. And this is at the birth of Christ. I'm going to learn something very special about Mary in this story. It's in Luke chapter 2. And it says this. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another. Let us go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. It goes on in verse 17 and says this. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, she kept all these things. She pondered them in her heart. There's something in this passage here. 
The scripture teaches this in Romans chapter 1. That every man that comes to this earth comes to know God. I don't know how. God has a way of making sure that you know who God is. He has a way of doing it. I don't care if it's through your parents. I don't care if it's through. The, 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 it's, it, it can be through the invisible things of him that are clearly seen Amen. being understood. Right? Amen. How he makes himself known to man. Somehow, some, it can be through radio ministry. It can be through television ministry. Amen. It can be through a lot of God use a different, a lot of different ways to make himself known unto man. The problem is that. Romans 1 says, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Amen. So what happens is, is that God made himself known, but instead of us saying, this is who he is, and giving him the glory that is due his name, what we did was didn't glorify him, and we did our own thing. Mm -hmm. Amen. When a man comes to know God because God makes himself known to every man, there are always going to be many reactions to this introduction to the Savior. Men act in different ways. A different reaction. If I were to ask each of you, and I know many of you, I know what your reaction has been to actually meeting. There are these many reactions, and it says this of the shepherds in verse 17. This was their reaction when they met him. They said that when they had seen it, look at what they did. They made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. That was their reaction to actually meeting the, the Savior. Why? Because when you meet the Savior, you may have a desire to come and see, but when you come and see, if you truly meet him, you have no other choice yeah. but to tell somebody. Yeah. You can't keep it to yourself. Amen. Jesus would come and he would say, now that I've showed you this, do me a favor. Go and tell no man. And you know what they would do? No they would man. run, run and tell everybody. Right. <laughs> because when you meet the Savior, you cannot meet him and not tell somebody. You have to tell somebody. When I got saved, I worked at TWA. You guys know the man Sam Shock. He led me to the Lord. You know what I did? I called on. I said, I'm bringing him home with me tonight. I said, because you got to come tell my wife what you told me. Because I got saved that night. And I couldn't help but go tell somebody. When you actually meet the Savior, you may have a, a, a desire to come and see, but when you come and see, if you truly have been saved, you have to make it known. Let me give you an account that Matthew gives to the same shepherds who came and saw. It says that when they came, this and look at what it says in Matthew chapter 2. He says that when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down. That was their reaction. They fell down mm, and worshiped him. Yes. You can't meet the Savior and not worship him. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you. It says that when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Yes. And look at this last verse. Don't ever miss it. It says, and being warned of God in the dream that they should not return to heaven. They departed unto their own country another way. Mm -hmm. You know what that verse is telling me? Mm -hmm. You can't come meet the Savior and go the same way you okay. can. Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. You can't come and meet the Savior and do what you used to do. Amen. You gotta go another way. Yes, yeah. sir. You can't do what you used to do. Amen. You wanna know if you met the Savior or you're doing the same thing you used to do. Okay. You can't meet him and go the same way. You won't find another way. And you know what he said? I'm I am the way. way. The truth. No man comes to the man but by me. But I want to look at what his mother, Mary, did. Look at her reaction when she met him. It says this in verse two, chapter two, verse nineteen. 
It says, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Amen. Now she just produced the baby. She's watching the wise men. She's watching the reaction. She's watching the shepherds. It's her baby. And she looked at it. And she, she kept it. Now when you keep something, you know what you do? You give it value. See, we don't keep something we don't want. Right? If you don't want it, you throw it away. What she did was she kept it. Mary, knowing that her son was this, she knew he was not on any son. She knew he was Emmanuel. She said, this is God with us. He was, in fact, the Christ. She knew he was God with us. And she kept this thing because she understood the value of who he was. That knowledge caused her to then ponder in her heart these things because before her was God manifest in the flesh. Hey, thank you. The one that she would be given the charge of training up in the way that he would go. That was something to ponder. She had to think about this. She had to ponder that this was more than just any child that she was been given the responsibility of training up. Mary had to ponder the fact that she had been given the responsibility, watch this, of training up God's child. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear me. Yes, we did. She thought about that. Mm -hmm. She said, this ain't Joseph's child. Because <laughs> see, I'm a virgin. Mm -hmm. That's right. Pregnant. That's right. Here he is. Mm -hmm. This ain't just anything. So she took it. That was her reaction to meeting the Savior. Because you have to understand this about Christ. Christ wasn't born in a manger. Christ came down from heaven. It just happened. It just happened to be in this earthly birth. What happened was deity became humanity. Amen. That's all that happened. Amen. He always has existed. Right. But deity became humanity, right. and that's what happened. And she's pondering, I just birthed deity. Right. Uh -huh. Every mother should look upon her child and consider. What God would have you to do with your child. Amen. That's what Hannah did with Samuel. Yes. The first thing that you need to do with your child is to turn your child over to the Lord. Amen. Every mother should look on her child and ponder in her heart. Who is this that God has given me? Because we don't know. I guarantee you my mother had no idea at my birth that I would be a pastor of a church. Amen. She had no idea that that's, but you know what? You don't have any idea either. So you know what you better do? You better ponder what God has given you. Because okay. children come from the Lord. Yes. Yes. You better ponder who your child is. And why did God give me this baby? And what am I to do in this child's life? And should I demonstrate something ungodly before God's child? Okay. Because I've been given the responsibility of training them up. Boy, if we, if we had that wisdom going into this thing, we would have a lot more godly children. Amen. Amen. And I'm just trying to give you some wisdom. Because you know what? I got a 30-year-old, a 31-year-old, but they will be in a couple weeks. Right? My kids are 30 and 29. And they, my sons are a father. And I wish I had received some of the wisdom that I'm trying to give you guys. Amen. 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 Your child may not be Jesus, but he or she should be turned over to the Lord because they are the, the, the Lord's child. And then they might become the people that God intended for them to be Amen. because of the influence so that you could be like Lois and Eunice Amen. who invested your child. Amen. In the Gospel of John, we have a story of the woman wedding at Cana. It says this in John chapter 2. 
And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Goes on and says this. And when they wanted wine, go ahead, Tikish. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, I want you to think about what he's saying. He says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Now I want you to, there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, because Jesus. He's not disrespecting her. She's been given this deity that she shouldn't receive. Even though she should be respected as the mother of Jesus. She's not God. Okay. And he recognizes that, but he says, first of all, mine hour is not yet come. Her mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you. He said, woman? He said, she said, yes, 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 sir. Whatsoever he tells me, I don't care what he called me. If he says do it, do it. That's where Nike got it. <laughs> Just do it. Mary clearly is not giving any deed over Jesus. No authority in scripture is, is ever given special attention, even from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, to Mary. He went so far as to call her woman, but the thing that we need to see of Mary is her understanding of her requirement, watch this, to live in obedience to the Lord and encourage others to live in obedience to the Lord. Mary, knowing who he was and what he was capable of, lived in obedience to his lordship. She could have challenged him and said, boy, don't you call me woman. I know what you all would do. Like this one said, woman, in public. In public. Woman. My mother used to tell me, she did. Boy, I knocked the black off. <laughs> used to say that. She did. She couldn't. But she used to tell me that. <laughs> she said, I knock your teeth down your throat. My mother, she said, but she grew up here. She didn't mean it. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> she said, yes, she did. Yes, she did. She did. Because I couldn't have called her a woman and got away with it. She did. I had one of them mothers, and I respected her. Let me tell you something. She kept me out of trouble. My mother, I did, just the mere thought of my mother kept me out of trouble. Because I thought, if my mother knows that I did this, what would she think? So there was a reverence that I had for her that kept me out of trouble. Amen. Kid, I, I'm a chaplain at Jackson County Jail. Those kids have no reverence for their parents. Amen. You know why? Because half of his parents is in a cell, three cells. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. <coughs> and then the grandfather's upstairs on the other floor. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. She could have said, what do you think? And who do you think that you are? Do you know who you're talking to? Do you know that I'm your mother? Mm -hmm. How dare you call me woman and do it publicly? Instead, in obedience to the Lord Christ, she humbled herself to let her others know whatsoever he say, do it. Amen. That is what a good mother does. She instructs others to obey the Lord, especially her children. So my question is to mothers is how do you encourage your children? Do you represent Lois and Eunice? Do you represent Bathsheba, who's warning your children? Do you represent Mary as the mother of your children? Do your children see a godliness in you that they won't find in the street, but they find it at home? Amen. Because if we're not doing that, we're, we're not training up children in the way that they should go. You train by demonstrating, not do as I say. 
and not do as I say, not as I do. We can't say that to our children anymore. We have to say, you do as you see me do. And if you don't see me do it, then don't you do it. Mm. See, we can't, you mean that. That's right. You're right. You know, we can't be fathers who's watching porn on our, on our, on our laptop hmm. and then get mad at our kids for catching us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We can't put our kids to bed at night so we can smoke out on the front porch. Oh, well. <laughs> Hiding the weed tin underneath the couch. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. We, we, we in that age now. Have our, our, all of the Vietnam era veterans in their 70s and stuff, they've been smoking weed for so long, it's crazy. That's why it's all legal. We can't be that parent. We can't be that mother. Our children need godliness. We have the fifth highest homicide rate in the country, Kansas City. Somewhere, somebody screwed up. So we got mothers in charge trying to fix it. And they won't work. But ain't no fathers in charge Amen. trying to fix it. Amen. Amen. You got Amen. to work. Amen. We're all jacked up. So you know what has to happen? It has to start somewhere. And you know where it needs to start? In our homes. Right? In our homes, training up our children, being godly parents to our children, setting a godly example, being the person that we're called to be. And you know how long you have to be the person God called you to be? Just, hold oh, on. You just got to do it today. Just be a godly mother today. For the rest of them. Right? Just be a godly mother just today. And then when tomorrow get here, you know what you need to do? Just be a godly mother tomorrow. And then the next day, just be a godly parent that day. And before you know it, the child will be in high school, junior high, you know what I'm saying? And then before you know it, you've trained up a child. But it takes consistency. And you know what that's the one thing we struggle with? It's consistency. It's being consistent. We'll do it for a minute. But we don't need our children, you, you don't get to be a parent for a minute. That's right. The minute you birth that child, you know what you are? You're a parent. And they're watching you. You know what they're They're watching every person you bring into their life. And they're looking at this guy saying, who is this guy? Why did you bring him here and why are we threatened by him? Why are you afraid of him? Because if you're afraid of him, I'm afraid of him. Right? Why are we going? Why did you bring us here? What are we doing here? Why are you doing that, Mom? Dad, why are you drinking and why are you why you you know you can't drink? And you all tall back in the boat. Why? Why are you doing this? And before you know it, you know what you have? You have another addict. You have another alcoholic that you trained up to be that. And now you're saying, help me with my child. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Hey, watch you. Yeah. So you know what God has given us? Another chance. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's given us another chance. It's another Mother's Day. And my Mother's Day message is I ain't giving you no flowery message. I'm going to try to challenge you to be a better parent. Amen. Amen. I'm going to try to challenge you, watch this, to not make the same mistakes that I made. Amen. Because it has to stop somewhere. Amen. Amen. You realize I'm the first generation true Christian in my family? We all grew up in Islam. I believe my mother was a believer because the last thing I did was make sure that she heard the gospel before she got to the And my mother trusted and believed it. And I preached her funeral. And my brothers and sisters looked at me like I was crazy. And my sister, my older sister told me, she said, once you a Muslim, you always a Muslim. I said, no, sweetie. I'm a new creature created in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That ain't who I am no more. So you can say whatever you want to. Right? I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded. 
that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. I know what I did. All right. All right. The first thing I did was make sure my kids were saved. I made sure. And here's the deal. If you don't know if your kids are saved, bring them to me. We'll make sure they're getting saved. Right? There's got to be a way. we got to change what we're doing. Amen? Amen. I, don't mean, I love y'all. I love this day. we got gifts for the ladies. We got gifts 